I sat by the window, watching the endless waters of the Pacific Ocean flicker beneath me. The sun reflected off the water's surface, creating dazzlingly bright glints, and it seemed as though the whole world was in a state of eternal tranquility. Inside the airplane cabin there was silence, broken only by the soft hum of the engines and occasional conversations among passengers. I felt remarkably relaxed, immersed in reading a book, occasionally distracted by the captivating views outside the window. Suddenly my idol was disrupted. The plane jolted. Initially I thought it was just turbulence, but then came other more powerful jolts. I noticed the faces of passengers transitioning from mild unease to palpable fear. Flight attendants, attempting to maintain calm, quickly went down the aisle, urging everyone to fasten their seatbelts. The air in the cabin grew tense as the plane began to lose altitude. Everything around vibrated and creaked, as if an old machine at its limit. The serene world around me, which had seemed so calm and peaceful just moments ago, suddenly turned into chaos. Panic began to grip the passengers. Cries and wails filled the cabin, contrasting with the previously prevailing silence. I huddled in my seat, looking out through the window and seeing the plane's wing bending and creaking under the pressure of unseen forces. The ocean, once so beautiful and boundless, now looked like an inexorable, menacing abyss, ready to swallow us. As the plane shook with renewed force, oxygen masks suddenly hissed and crackled from the ceiling. I grabbed one and quickly put it on, following the instructions. Around me, passengers in panic tried to do the same. Some froze in shock, unable to perform even this simple action. Fear gripped my heart. Thoughts of home, family, and unrealized dreams raced through my mind. In that moment I realized the fragility of our existence, how quickly everything can change. Just when it seemed like the plane was starting to stabilize, the unthinkable happened. A terrifying, ear-splitting roar shook the cabin, and the plane, like a toy in the hands of an invisible giant, sharply bent. Through the noise and vibration, I felt the floor beneath me give way, and my gaze met the open expanse of the Pacific Ocean below us. The plane tore in half, and I, like everyone else around, was doomed to witness this disaster from within. The force dividing the plane was so great that the moment seemed like eternity. Time slowed down, allowing me to notice every detail. How seats ripped from the floor, how passengers' personal belongings soared into the air, creating chaos with books, phones, blankets. People screamed, but their voices drowned in the deafening roar of destruction. And then I lost consciousness. I woke up to the rustle of leaves and birdsong nearby. Moments later I realized that my body was unnaturally constrained, and the seatbelt dug into my chest, holding me in the seat, which seemed to be suspended in the air. My eyes slowly adjusted to the light, and I began to look around, trying to understand where I was. The first thing that caught my eye was the tree branches, wrapping around the seat as if nature was trying to embrace or prevent me from falling. I tried to move, but a painful bout of dizziness made me stop. My body felt alien, and every movement caused discomfort. Taking a deep breath, I felt a strong thirst, as if I hadn't drunk anything for eternity. Carefully, trying not to provoke a new wave of dizziness, I looked down and truly realized my situation for the first time. The height at which I was perched instantly caused nausea. I realized that I was stuck in the seat high among the trees, which closely hugged the sandy shore. My gaze darted around, trying to find any support. But all around were only forest, ocean, and... Airplane wreckage. It was scattered all along the shore. Passengers' belongings clothes, books, photographs. All of it now lay on the ground, 
creating a sad landscape of destruction. And among the trees and on the ground, I saw something that made my heart stop. Bodies of people. Not only the height, but also the realization of the tragedy that had happened to these people, to us, made me feel sick. I tried to scream, but my voice got stuck in my throat, leaving only a quiet moan. Memories of the flight, of the moment of the crash, began to flash through my mind, but they were incomplete and didn't give the full picture of what had happened. Hanging amidst the branches, as I tried to regain my composure, something caught my attention. I noticed movement among the wreckage and lifeless bodies on the ground. My heart froze. At first I thought it was rescuers, but the longer I watched, the more horrifying this discovery seemed. The figure skulking among the ruins was too large and agile for a human, too dark and menacing. Upon closer inspection, I realized that before me was not a human. It was something else. A humanoid wolf, a creature from nightmares, with a massive, terrifying maw and thick fur covering its entire body. It darted from body to body with inhuman agility, occasionally pausing to wrench heads from the unfortunate crash victims. I froze, barely daring to breathe, trying to remain unnoticed. My heart pounded furiously, each beat echoing in my ears, as if it could be heard for miles around. The sight was repulsive, and I felt nauseous. The monster continued its grim task, paying no attention to me. At one point, it came so close to my hiding spot among the branches that I could discern every scar and patch of fur on its body. I silently prayed that it wouldn't look up, wouldn't notice me. With each step it took, it seemed as though the ground trembled and the air filled with a wild, animalistic scent. Finally, to my indescribable relief, the creature passed by without detecting my presence. It continued on its path from corpse to corpse, gathering heads into a horrifying necklace around its neck. With each step, it moved farther away until it disappeared into the dense green darkness of the forest, leaving behind only dead silence and a sense of unspeakable horror. I remained suspended between heaven and earth, trembling with fear and cold, trying to gather my thoughts. What was that? Why was it doing such dreadful things? Questions swirled in my head, for which I had no answers. The only thing I knew for sure, I needed to get out of here before that creature returned. After waiting for some time, I decided it was time to act. I grabbed the seatbelt with both hands, feeling my fingers numb from tension and effort. With difficulty, gasping for breath and fearing to look down, I pressed the buckle, and suddenly the world tilted. The belt gave way, and I, barely maintaining balance, quickly grabbed the nearest branch, its bark digging into my palms. My heart pounded wildly in my chest as I, weighing each movement, began to cautiously descend, moving from branch to branch. My muscles burned from the strain, and my hands trembled violently. Finally, I found myself on the ground, on my knees amidst leaves and small twigs, exhausted from thirst and fatigue. I was desperately thirsty. Trying to regain my mental balance, I slowly made my way through the wreckage of the plane, trying to avoid the dead bodies. My gaze involuntarily slid over scattered belongings, searching for something that could help me survive. And then I saw them. A couple of water bottles miraculously left intact amidst the chaos of destruction. My heart swelled with joy, and forgetting for a moment about the exhaustion and pain in every muscle, I hurried towards them. With difficulty, I opened the cap of the first bottle and took a deep drink, feeling relief and strength with every sip. The water had a slightly bitter taste, but at that moment, it seemed like the most delicious drink I had ever tasted. Sitting on the ground amidst the wreckage and chaos, 
I tried to gather my thoughts and plan my next steps. It was crystal clear to me that the top priority was to ensure my survival by securing everything necessary. Also, I needed to stay vigilant. That creature could return at any moment. Firstly, I decided to focus on food and water supplies. I scoured the area, searching for anything that could serve as sustenance, but found only a few packs of dry biscuits and a couple of water bottles. This would barely last a couple of days. Water especially was a problem. I would need to search for drinkable sources later. Next, I began searching for useful items. Any object could prove extremely valuable. After a lengthy search, I found a knife, blankets, a flashlight, a first aid kit, and rummaging through someone's suitcase, a couple of t-shirts in my size. I decided to gather all the found items in one place for easy access. Procuring fire was third on the list of priorities. Fire was essential not only for warmth and cooking, but also for protection against wild animals and as a signal for rescuers. Especially, fire was crucial for purifying drinking water. Once I watched a survival show where participants prioritized finding a source of drinking water and a way to make fire. Drinking untreated water was dangerous. It needed to be boiled. However, I couldn't find matches or a lighter anywhere and starting a fire by friction was a difficult task. So I decided to check the pockets of the decapitated bodies. Overcoming nausea, I began to search their pockets, and finally, near the body of a burly man, I found a lighter in the pocket of his jeans. I flicked it, and the fire lit up, which greatly pleased me. The next task was to drag the bodies and bury them, which was perhaps the most challenging trial not only physically, but also morally. I knew it had to be done to prevent disease spread and attracting predators. I decided to search for a suitable spot nearby and, at least symbolically, bury them, paying respects to the deceased. It took the remainder of the day, and it was beginning to get dark. After some contemplation, I decided to stay close to the crash site. Rescuers would likely start their search from here. I resolved that tomorrow, I would need to create an SOS signal at a visible location, using branches, rocks, or any other available materials. Determining my current location became the next crucial task. I needed to understand whether I was on an island or the mainland. This knowledge was critically important for planning further survival steps. If rescuers didn't arrive soon, I would have to start exploring the surroundings for food, water, and possibly civilization. Before it got completely dark, I managed to find thick bushes not far from the shore. This place seemed like an ideal shelter for the night, hidden and protected, yet close enough to the crash site for easy access to the wreckage if rescuers arrived. I moved all the found items there, including a couple of water bottles, dry rations, and medical supplies. I laid a piece of cloth I found among the wreckage on the ground. It was supposed to serve as my mattress. I covered the entrance to my shelter with branches to make it as inconspicuous as possible for anyone who might be nearby. Not starting a fire seemed like the most reasonable decision. Despite the cold night ahead, which promised to be tough, I understood that a fire could attract the attention of that creature, the humanoid wolf, which roamed among the bodies and wreckage. As night descended, shrouding the land in its dark cloak, I settled in, trying to get as comfortable as possible, and despite all my fears and worries, soon fell asleep. The sleep was troubled, filled with dreams of home, family, and the inevitable fear of the unknown. Suddenly, I was awakened by a strange noise from the shore, scraping, rustling, as if someone or something was rummaging through the wreckage. Carefully, trying not to make a sound, I crawled to the edge of the bushes and peeked outside. In the light of the moon, I saw him. That same creature, the humanoid wolf, had returned. It moved slowly among the wreckage, occasionally pausing to sniff or pick something up from the ground. 
Its massive figure stood out against the nocturnal landscape, and its eyes occasionally gleamed in the darkness when caught by the moonlight. I held my breath, watching its actions, my heart pounding in unison with each of its steps. But then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature vanished, melting into the night, leaving only the sound of waves and wind in its wake. I crawled back into my hiding place, trying to calm my pounding heart. The night was restless. My thoughts kept returning to what I had seen on the shore and the possibility of encountering the unknown threat face to face. Waking up in the morning, I felt tired as if I hadn't slept at all. Nevertheless, there was much work to be done, and I couldn't afford to despair. I had breakfast, carefully rationing the remaining food supplies. Every piece of biscuit now seemed as precious as gold, and I understood that I needed to find a way to replenish my supplies before they ran out. After breakfast, I got to work. Using branches and rocks, I assembled huge SOS letters in an open space near the camp. This task took me several hours and a lot of effort, but I knew it was necessary to attract the attention of rescuers. Each letter laid out on the ground seemed like a cry for help that I hoped would be heard. Then I began searching for a water source. Venturing into the depths of the forest, I discovered a small stream with clean, cool water. I was lucky. I filled the bottles and allowed myself a moment of relief. Having water meant a chance of survival, and I felt a surge of strength. During my search, I also came across berries, beautiful and enticing, but I didn't know if they were poisonous or not. My intuition warned me to beware of unknown berries, and I decided not to risk it. Without knowledge of the local flora, eating something at random would be too dangerous. Realizing that I also needed to find a source of food, I began to contemplate plans for the future. In the forest, there were bound to be fruits, nuts, or even small animals that could be caught. However, as it was getting dark, I decided it was best to return to camp and postpone these tasks until tomorrow. When I returned to camp, I again decided not to light a fire. Although I needed to boil water, I decided to drink the remaining. I had dinner and returned to my shelter in the bushes. The night passed surprisingly calmly, without anxious sounds or unexpected appearances. In the morning, I finally decided to light a fire. Although this decision didn't come easily, as I remembered the possible threat posed by the creature wandering at night, the risk seemed justified. Clean water was a guarantee of health and survival. On the shore, among the wreckage and items washed up by the waves, I found a piece of iron that could serve as a container for boiling water. It was a fortunate find, allowing me not only to boil water but also to diversify my diet a bit if I managed to find something else to eat. I gathered twigs and dry branches, carefully stacking them into a pile for a fire. With the help of the found lighter, the fire was kindled without much effort. The flames crackled, illuminating the morning with new colors and filling the air with the smell of smoke. The iron piece, serving as my pot, I placed on the fire, filling it with water from the stream. After the water had boiled for a sufficient time, I removed the pot from the fire and let it cool down. After some time, when the water had cooled to a safe temperature, I carefully poured it into empty bottles found earlier. Now, with a supply of clean water, I felt slightly more prepared for what lay ahead. Next, I needed to find something to snack on. Exploring the beach for food, I hoped to find coconuts, which could serve as both food and water sources. However, to my disappointment, not a single coconut was in sight. The prospect of venturing further down the beach into the impenetrable forest to search for food frightened me. I wasn't ready to face the unknown lurking in its shadowy depths yet. After some deliberation, I remembered the berries I had found earlier. They seemed familiar to me, and in a moment of desperation, 
I decided to take a risk. Approaching the spot where I had found them, I saw plenty of red berries sparkling enticingly in the sunlight. Carefully trying one, I found it to be quite palatable, and I began to eat them eagerly, gathering a supply in a bag. Returning to camp, I soon began to feel unwell. A feeling of dread engulfed me, realizing that perhaps the berries were indeed poisonous. In panic, I threw away the bag, the berries spilling onto the ground. Nausea overwhelmed me, and without hesitation I grabbed a bottle of water, trying to induce vomiting to cleanse my stomach of the poison. The night turned into a nightmare. I was racked with sickness, my body shaking with chills, and fever causing the world around me to sway and distort. I lay on the cold ground, exhausted and alone, as the darkness of the forest consumed me entirely. By morning, exhausted and weakened, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, the first thing I did was look at the sun and realize that lunchtime had passed already. My condition was far from ideal. My head was spinning, and my stomach was empty. The found bottle of water became my salvation. How fortunate that I stocked up on water in advance, I thought, taking small sips to avoid triggering a new bout of nausea. After lying for another hour, I finally felt like I was starting to recover. Evening was approaching, and I decided it was best to dedicate the rest of the day to rest. There was still some food left from the plane, but I realized that tomorrow I would have to look for new sources of food. The next morning, I got up early. After scanning the sky and the sea for signs of a rescue operation and finding nothing encouraging, I decided to walk along the beach in search of something edible. After a couple of miles along the sandy shore, I finally found what I had been looking for for so long coconuts. Running up to a tree, I noticed a couple of coconuts lying on the ground. Using a knife, I made a hole in one of them and drank the sweet juice, feeling how each sip brought relief and strength. Then I cracked the coconut in half and ate the flesh, savoring every bite. Having quenched my thirst and hunger, I decided to gather more coconuts for supplies. After collecting a small pile, I was about to return to camp when suddenly, in the distance further down the beach, I noticed something unusual. It was a structure resembling a lighthouse. I was greatly surprised, but at the same time I was overjoyed. It was the first sign of civilization on this island. Deciding to explore the lighthouse while it was still light, I headed towards it, keeping in mind that I still had enough time to return to camp by evening. As I approached the lighthouse, it seemed more and more impressive, like a guardian standing alone at the edge of the world. Finally, I reached it and realized that the lighthouse was very ancient. The structure was tall and slender, weathered by time, with stones covered in moss and lichen. Its walls, made of roughly hewn stones, bore traces of years of struggle with the sea winds and storms. In some places, the plaster had crumbled away, exposing the sturdy but time-worn masonry. It seemed that the lighthouse had not been used for many decades, if not centuries. Rust covered the metal elements of the structure, and the door at the entrance was half open, creaking on old hinges with every gust of wind. The windows on the upper floors, where the lantern room usually is, were either boarded up or broken, leaving the interior of the lighthouse at the mercy of fate. Entering the lighthouse, I felt centuries-old dust rising into the air with every step I took. The staircase in front of me looked extremely unreliable, as if each step could crumble at the slightest touch. But despite my fears, I cautiously began to climb up. During the ascent, my attention was drawn to strange paintings on the walls, incomprehensible symbols and images, including bats, which gave the interior a sense of mystery and made me wonder about the origin of the lighthouse and its purpose. These ancient signs, 
inscribed on the walls millennia ago, created a sense of connection with a long forgotten past. Reaching the top, I found myself in a spacious room with a panoramic view of the ocean and the surrounding forest. In the center stood something remarkable, a horizontal wheel, reminiscent in shape of a ship's wheel, but lying on its side. Around the room were also various ancient paintings, among which I noticed an image of a bat and a wolf facing each other, as if they were enemies or guardians of some ancient secret. I examined the room for a long time, and when my curiosity got the better of me, I decided to try turning the wheel. At first it seemed immovable, but with more effort, I managed to move it. After several turns, the ground suddenly shook beneath my feet. A mild earthquake began. Terrified by my actions, I heard a terrible screech to the south of the lighthouse. Looking outside, I saw a whole flock of birds rising high into the sky from deep within the forest, as if something had scared them. At that moment, I realized the folly of my actions. Maybe I released that creature outside, or something worse. The thought flashed through my mind, but then my gaze caught sight of smoke to the southeast. My heart filled with hope. It could be locals or survivors from the plain. Perhaps the tail fell in another place. The decision was made instantly. I had to head in that direction to find out what was happening there and possibly find salvation, or at least company amidst this boundless emptiness. Descending from the lighthouse, I paused for a moment to gather my thoughts and pull myself together. Before me lay a long journey through impenetrable forest, and I had to traverse it as quietly as possible. Although the discovery of the lighthouse and the impending exploration filled me with joy and hope, memories of the creature that had severed heads were still fresh in my mind. I prepared myself for caution, reminding myself that safety must come first. As I made my way through the forest, trying to make as little noise as possible, the leaves rustled beneath my feet and branches occasionally snapped, but I tried to minimize these sounds. Soon, I began to notice signs of human activity. Felled trees, tracks on the ground, and paths that seemed too smooth for the wild nature. One of such paths that I found led directly to the source of the smoke. So people lived here, I thought, but I didn't forget the need to be cautious. After about an hour of walking, the trail widened and I decided to veer off it to move along, hiding behind trees. Soon I approached the palisade. At the entrance stood a couple of natives with spears. They didn't resemble representatives of modern civilization, but rather a people lost in time. Their bodies were adorned with tattoos and huge round earrings adorned their ears. I paused, trying to assess the situation. The decision to approach and try to establish contact with them seemed too risky. What if they were hostile? What if they were connected to the creature I saw in the forest? On the other hand, they might have knowledge of the area or even offer help. After a brief hesitation, I decided not to take the risk. Until I knew how they would react to a stranger, it was better to avoid them. Carefully, Trying not to reveal my presence, I began to circumvent the meeting place, staying away from the palisade while still trying not to lose direction to the source of the smoke. Circling the palisade, I found a small opening hidden among the thickets. Deciding to take advantage of this opportunity, I carefully slipped through it and found myself inside the village. I was behind small straw huts built from local materials and covered with palm leaves. Inside the village there was silence, and I could only hear the beat of drums coming from the center of the settlement. Creeping closer, hiding behind the huts and trees, I discovered that the village was built around a large open space. In its center burned a huge bonfire, around which dozens of natives had gathered. 
They were dressed in simple clothing made of natural fabrics and adorned with various tattoos covering much of their bodies. Many of them wore round earrings and in their hands they held various items, from musical instruments to tools. The natives were engrossed in a ritual. Their bodies moved to the rhythm of the drums and their faces expressed a wide range of emotions, from joy to trance. Passion and mysticism blended in this place, creating a unique atmosphere. In the center of this gathering, I saw two people tied to stakes, a woman with European features and a young man of Asian descent. Their faces were filled with fear and despair, and around them, the natives danced, creating a frightening spectacle. My heart froze with horror at the thought that these people might become victims of a cannibalistic ritual. I noticed hungry looks from women and children directed at the captives. Some of them held knives and plates in their hands. I watched all this in disbelief, unable to comprehend it. I began to think of ways to save them, but nothing came to mind. I wasn't a hero. Rushing out and trying to fight the natives would be foolish, and within a minute, I would be tied to a stake. As the natives brought a couple of wooden stakes in the shape of the letter X and placed them next to the bonfire opposite each other, the atmosphere in the village became even more tense. It became clear to me that they were preparing for something horrifying. When they began to pull out the stake to which the woman was tied, I understood their intent. They were going to roast the captives alive. My heart froze in anticipation of the inevitable. But then a terrible scream rang out, causing everyone to freeze. The drums fell silent, and the dance ceased. The natives looked around in terror, their faces distorted with fear. Suddenly, something invisible flew through the air and snatched one of them away. Panic gripped the village. Cries and chaos filled the square. Some of the natives grabbed bows, trying to defend themselves, but the creature moved with incredible speed, like lightning, tearing its victims away one by one. By some miracle, one of the natives managed to wound the creature, angering it. It emitted a loud cry and latched onto the man. Now that it was visible, I could see it. The creature was completely bald, with bat wings growing from its back. Its bald head and a pair of long fangs protruding from its mouth gave it a vampiric appearance. The creature sank its teeth into the man's neck and began to suck his blood, eliciting desperate cries and attempts at salvation. Soon, the village emptied as the surviving natives scattered in horror, leaving behind only chaos and destruction. Once the attack of the terrifying creature subsided, and the last echoes of its screams dissolved into the evening air. I looked around. The village seemed abandoned, and I realized that this was my chance to help the prisoners. Carefully crouching, I made my way to them. In their eyes, already resigned to their dreadful fate, a spark of hope ignited when they saw me. First, I freed the woman. The stake to which she was to be tied had already been torn from the ground and abandoned during the natives' chaotic flight. After freeing her, I noticed her rubbing her hands and feet, trying to regain feeling after being motionless for so long. She opened her mouth to say something, but I immediately put a finger to my lips, signaling for silence. Then I headed to the second captive. Once both were free, we quietly made our way to the exit of the village, slipped through the hole in the palisade, and delved deeper into the forest. After covering some distance, we decided to take a short break. The woman looking at me in astonishment asked what the creature was. I replied that I didn't know. Then I introduced myself, saying my name was Mark. She responded that her name was Anna and she was from England. The third guy looked at us, not understanding our conversation. When I pointed to myself and Anna, calling out our names, he understood and introduced himself as Lee. 
Anna explained that Lee didn't speak English, only Chinese, but they had found a way to communicate. She explained that they were in the tail section of the plane when it crashed. Only the two of them survived. One night, while they were waiting for help, the natives came and abducted them. Sitting in the shelter surrounded by dense forest, we contemplated our next steps. I shared with Anna and Lee my ideas on how we could survive. First and foremost, we needed to determine whether we were on an island or on the mainland. Anna reported seeing from the plane that we were approaching land. It was an island with a volcano in the middle. This knowledge significantly altered our plans. Realizing that we faced the challenge of survival in the harsh conditions of the island, I told them about the encounter with another monster I had faced earlier. Anna was astonished by this story. We concluded that the safest course of action would be to stay closer to the shore in case someone came to rescue us while avoiding any dangers lurking deeper in the island. The idea of building a raft and attempting to leave the island was dismissed as unrealistic. The size of the Pacific Ocean and the lack of necessary skills and materials made this plan too risky. We continued to discuss our plans when suddenly, in the silence of the forest, we heard sounds, rustling and whispers. It was the natives, and they were approaching our shelter. Quietly, barely breathing, we began to retreat deeper into the forest, trying not to make any unnecessary noise. But our presence did not go unnoticed. The natives spotted us and began to chase us. Fear drove us and we ran through the dense vegetation of the forest, dodging obstacles at full speed. When we emerged into a clearing, arrows flew at us. With a heart ready to burst from my chest, we continued to run, dodging the dangers flying towards us. Suddenly, Anna stumbled and fell. Lee and I immediately stopped and helped her up when a spear impaled the ground next to me. It was a reminder that every delay could cost us our lives. We resumed our flight. Ahead of us lay open terrain littered with large volcanic rocks. It was not an ideal hiding place, but we had no choice. We had to keep running. But suddenly, as we crossed the rough terrain, the ground literally gave way beneath our feet, and we fell into a deep pit. Coming to my senses, I looked around and realized that we were in a cave. Looking up, I saw a huge hole in the cave's ceiling, through which the sky could be seen. Above us, the natives leaned over with spears at the ready. Realizing the danger, I grabbed Anna and Lee and ran deeper into the cave. Behind us, the sound of falling spears echoed, a clear sign that the natives were not backing down. Taking a brief moment to catch our breath, I instinctively pulled a flashlight out of my bag. Its beam of light instantly dispelled the darkness and we realized that we were in a man-made cave. The walls were smooth and even, indicating that the cave had been carved out of the rock centuries ago. We sat, lost in thought about what to do next, when suddenly we noticed that the natives had begun to descend into the cave. Desperation gripped me at the thought that our pursuers were not giving up. What had we done to them? I asked myself. With no other option, we decided to continue running deeper into the cave. I turned on the flashlight and illuminated the path, trying to avoid collisions with protruding rocks and other obstacles. Our breaths merged with the echo of our footsteps, reflected off the cave walls. Soon, we came to a fork in the path. The path split into two directions, left and right. To the left, I felt a faint breeze, which could indicate an exit or at least a more spacious chamber. Lee seemed to sense the same and pointed in the same direction. Without wasting time on deliberation, we ran to the left. Voices of the natives could be heard behind us, indicating that they had not given up their pursuit. Continuing our flight from our pursuers, we soon emerged into a huge cavern, in the center of which sprawled a magnificent lake. 
Desperation engulfed me as I heard the cries of our pursuers growing closer. Dozens of evacuation plans raced through my mind, and I was ready to dive into the water to swim across the lake. But then Lee shouted and pointed at the cave wall. Approaching closer, I noticed a narrow path along the wall. It looked slippery, but we decided to take the risk and began to move slowly along it. When we had covered half the distance, Anna suddenly screamed and pointed downwards towards the surface of the water. There, in the murky depths of the lake, swam huge creatures resembling amphibians with impressive fangs. We looked at each other, realizing how lucky we were that we hadn't dared to make a desperate jump. At that moment, our pursuers burst into the cave. Seeing us, they headed towards us along the path. We froze in anticipation of spears or arrows flying at us, but it seemed that the natives had run out of ammunition and decided to catch up with us at close range. The tribesmen moved less cautiously than us, and soon one of them slipped and fell into the water. Immediately, monsters swam up to him. Water splashed, tinted red with blood, and a wild cry echoed from the man. Frozen with horror, we and the remaining tribesmen watched this horrifying spectacle. But then we snapped out of it and, seizing the moment, continued our escape along the path, striving to leave this place as soon as possible. Soon we emerged from the cavern with the lake and found ourselves in a wide corridor, which to our surprise was illuminated by yellow glowing stones. They emitted warmth, creating the illusion that lava was slowly flowing down the walls. These walls were adorned with inscriptions and ornaments, reminiscent of ancient and forgotten civilizations. But we had no time to examine the surroundings. We kept running, although our strength was gradually dwindling. Looking back, I saw our pursuers, who were not giving up. But soon we burst into an open hall, in the center of which stood a huge altar. On the altar was a massive stone wolf's head, and beneath it lay offerings of human heads. Among them, I noticed fresh heads and recalled how the monster had torn them off after the crash. The realization dawned on me that we had come straight into the lair of this creature, and despair engulfed me. We looked around for an exit, but found nothing but smooth walls. The cannibals were getting closer, and it seemed like the end. Weary, I sat down, expecting my fate, when suddenly, tribesmen rushed into the room from the corridor, heading straight towards us. At the moment when the tension reached its peak, and it seemed that there were no options left for our salvation, unexpectedly, a werewolf leaped from the ceiling right between us and the approaching cannibals. The creature with its hungry and wild gaze began to survey those around, and its powerful body tensed, ready to attack. The cannibals, seeing this monster, immediately fell to their knees, uttering something in their language. Apparently, they revered the werewolf as a sacred creature or protector. My companions and I, overwhelmed with fear and confusion, did not know what to do next. Suddenly, Lee grabbed my hand and dropped to the ground, repeating after the tribesmen. Anna and I followed his lead, kneeling beside him. The werewolf, noticing our submission, glanced at us, then back at the tribesmen. It approached them and began to sniff them, as if choosing its prey. Suddenly, it stopped at one of the men and swiftly tore off his head. Raising it up, the werewolf drank the blood, roaring loudly. After that, it turned its terrible head in our direction, and I thought our end had come. But in response to its roar, a familiar screech echoed from the ceiling. The werewolf tensed and bared its teeth, preparing for a new threat. My gaze wandered in search of an exit. Suddenly, I noticed a small tunnel behind one of the columns, barely large enough for a person to squeeze through. Pointing it out to my companions, we all understood that this was our chance. We began to crawl towards the tunnel, trying not to attract the werewolf's attention, 
which was completely absorbed in the impending battle with the bat. The werewolf made the first lunge, trying to grab the opponent with its powerful paws, but the bat deftly dodged, rising into the air. It responded with a swift dive, attempting to strike the werewolf with its claws. The sounds of their collision, loud growls and screeches filled the cavern, echoing off its walls, making everything around freeze in anticipation. The werewolf, using its strength and agility, tried to knock the opponent off course, delivering powerful blows with its paws. In turn, the bat demonstrated incredible maneuverability, avoiding direct collisions and attempting to bite the werewolf, using its sharp teeth. At some point, the battle reached its climax. The werewolf grabbed the bat by one of its wings, trying to pin it to the ground, but the bat, using all its strength, broke free, inflicting a deep wound on the werewolf's side with its claws. In pain and rage, the werewolf let out a loud howl, which reverberated off the walls of the cavern, causing everything living around to freeze. The battle continued, seemingly endless, with each participant unwilling to yield. The air was filled with the scent of blood and adrenaline. Meanwhile, we used this moment to hide in the tunnel, hoping to find a path to freedom and safety in its depths. My companions crawled in first, and as I was about to follow them, something landed near me with a dull thud. I turned my gaze to the left and saw the severed head of the werewolf. Then I looked back and saw how the bat began to kill the tribesmen, cries and screams coming from there. I hurried up and crawled into the hole when I heard a scream from behind. The creature was trying to reach out and grab me, but the gap was too small and its wings were getting in the way. I watched in fear as it tried to reach me and then it backed off. For a moment I was stunned. Then I heard Anna calling me and I continued on my way. After crawling a considerable distance, feeling the pain in our knees, we found ourselves in another room. This cave had no single source of light and I quickly pulled out my flashlight to illuminate the surroundings. Before us lay a room filled with numerous skulls. The walls, on the other hand, were adorned with ornaments and drawings, creating a gloomy and mysterious atmosphere. Especially prominent was a huge drawing in the center of the wall. It was an image of a humanoid wolf, majestically seated on a throne. Around him, people knelt. Waves emanated from the wolf, and his hand was directed towards them. Upon closer inspection, I realized that some of these people were beginning to transform, their forms distorting, indicating a possible transformation into werewolves. This discovery left us frozen in awe and horror at the mystical power depicted on the wall. Next on the wall was depicted an army of werewolves battling an army of humans. This epic battle seemed endless, but we could not see its outcome as part of the wall in this area was destroyed. Around this spot lingered the sense of an ancient battle that left no winners. Looking around for further passage, we noticed another tunnel. We had no choice but to continue our journey into the unknown. The tunnel began to slope slowly upwards, and soon we saw the starry sky through an opening in the ceiling. Emerging outside, we found ourselves in the forest. The fresh air and stars overhead after the stuffy air of the cave were truly refreshing. We sat down on the ground, trying to catch our breath and gather our thoughts after everything we had seen. The surrounding silence of the forest seemed almost unreal after the chaos and horrors we had experienced in the depths of the dungeon. I pulled out a water bottle and dry rations and shared them with my companions. They thanked me and after quenching our thirst and hunger, we decided to head back to the shore. Carefully making our way through the dense forest, we suddenly heard in the distance that piercing scream that had once again struck fear into our hearts. Trying to move as quietly as possible, we continued our journey until we reached the shore. 
Orienting ourselves by the surrounding landscape, I saw the familiar lighthouse, which to our surprise was lit. But as we approached closer, the light suddenly went out, leaving us bewildered. Without wasting time on contemplation, we decided to continue our movement. Soon we stumbled upon the pile of coconuts I had left earlier. After we had a hearty snack and took more coconuts for the journey ahead, we headed towards my camp. Arriving there exhausted, I collapsed in the bushes on my improvised mattress and fell asleep immediately. Early in the morning, I was awakened by a jolt and Anna's joyful cry. She excitedly reported that a ship was visible at sea. I jumped up instantly and saw Lee waving on the shore, trying to attract the attention of the passing vessel. For a moment, it seemed like the ship would sail past. But then we saw a boat being lowered from its side. After some time, the boat approached us, and on board were two men. We told them about our adventures, and they took us aboard the ship. The captain of the ship was amazed by our story, and informed us that the search for our plane was being conducted in a completely different location, and they had stumbled upon this island completely by chance. When I asked how they found the island, the captain replied that he had noticed the light from the lighthouse at night. At that moment, in the distance, that terrifying scream echoed again. The captain became alarmed, and we began to implore him to leave the island as soon as possible. Agreed, he ordered to raise the anchor, and we set sail. As we sailed away from the island, I looked back for the last time, realizing that this island had become both a savior and a deadly threat to me.